Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Tonight we're in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 18 to the end of the chapter, verse 29. And I think this is the crescendo of the sermon. This is, this is where the sermon reaches its moment of impact, its moment of vision, its moment where it calls people into the, the reality and why you don't want to give this up. Persevere, because this is where you are. This is where you have come. This is where you are living now. Don't give up. And God's about to shake the world again. And something new is coming beyond even what you experience in this moment. There's a newness that's still to come. But there's already a sense in which we participate in that newness. So the whole sermon is bringing us to this point. From chapter 10, verse 19, to chapter 12, verse 29, it's all about participating in what God has done. When we go back to the beginning in chapter 1, and chapters 1 through 4, it's about the, uh, the deity and incarnation of the Son, and then the priesthood of the Son in verse chapters 4 to 10. But in chapter 10, verse 19, it says, Therefore, let us enter, let us with confidence enter into the most holy sanctuary, into the presence of God. Let's, let's go in. Christ has made a way for us. Let's go in. Let's participate. Let's continue our journey. Let's maintain our faith. Let's persevere. Or as we had last week in chapter 12, let us run the race right? and keep our eye on Jesus. Just like others have done before us, the heroes of the faith who have preceded us. Right? So we come to this moment. At the end of the sermon, think about it as, okay, this is the final moment of the sermon. It's the invitation song kind of thing. You know, those of us who grew up with that kind of world. Um, this is the moment of climax. And it's one of my favorite texts in the Bible. It was my, one of my mother's favorite texts. And when she heard me preach a sermon on this text, the first time she heard me preach on this text, and I've done it many times because of what she told me to do. Because she told me, um, John Mark, whenever you go somewhere new, you preach that. <laughs> That's what you do. That's the first thing you tell them. Yeah, it's the first, you know, so whenever I go somewhere new, if, unless they have something special, they want, you know, some special topic. When I go somewhere new, this is what I do. I talk about this text. Because I think it is that crescendo of the sermon. I tend to think chapter 13, and, and a lot of people disagree with this, and there's a lot of different opinions about it, so I could be, could be wrong. I tend to think of chapter 13 as sort of an epilogue or something that's attached to the sermon, kind of a, what you, it, it has more of the feel of a letter. Uh, certainly ends that way at the end of chapter 13. Um, so, but that's, that's differences of opinion about that. But theologically, it seems to me, we reach this moment of embrace in chapter 12, verses 18 and following. So let's read this together. Hebrews 12, beginning of verse 18. I'm reading from the New International Version here. You have not come to a mountain that can be touched and that is burning with fire to darkness, gloom, and storm to a trumpet blast or to such a voice speaking words that those who heard it begged that no further word be spoken to them because they could not bear what was commanded. If even an animal touches the mountain, it must be stoned to death. The sight was so terrifying that Moses said, I am trembling with fear. But you have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, 
You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. See to it that you do not refuse him who speaks. If they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, how much less will we if we turn away from him who warns us from heaven? At that time, his voice shook the earth. But now he has promised, once more, I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate the removing or changing of what can be shaken, that is, created things, so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming power. The word of the consuming fire, I should say. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's set this up a little bit. Because we have two mountains in view here. We have one, one mountain we'll call, it's Mount Sinai. And we have the people of Israel gathered at the foot of the mountain. But at a distance. They can't touch it or they'll die. Right? But then we have another mountain. And I'm going to put it up here. And this mountain is Mount Zion. The contrast between these two mountains, you might even think about it as, okay, and here we are, uh, let's say uh, people of faith, let's say faith is gathered here at this mountain, believers, disciples, the people of God are gathered before this mountain, you might say. What is, how is the, what's the mood around this mountain? What, what do you hear when you, when you read verses 18 to 21? Fear. What's the mood? Okay, we got fear. How is that present? How is that represented here? Who's afraid? Everybody's afraid, yeah, okay. Uh, even Moses is afraid. Right? What are they afraid of? The presence of God. Okay, how's the presence of God? And that's a good, that's a great point. This presence, this divine presence is here. And what's the evidence of that divine presence? Okay, fire. What else? Smoke, cloud, smoke. What else? Trembling, trumpet. Yeah, trumpet blast. Burning bush. Now, burning bush, that would be with Moses, right? When, when Moses was there, right? before this moment. This moment is, because uh, we're quoting Exodus 19 in this text. So this moment is when Israel has crossed the Red Sea and come to Mount Sinai uh, and we have this, remember the whole story that is a part of our, of our narrative in Hebrews? We have Exodus, Sinai, wilderness, and didn't give myself enough space here, and land, or the rest, right? The promised rest that they were just received. So that, that's the backstory. Coming out of Egypt, coming to Mount Sinai, and then in the wilderness. And that's going to be important when we get to the second half of our text here to remember that backstory. So, what else is evidence of this divine presence? 
What else do you see there? Ah, yeah, it's dark, darkness. And we get to kind of a, you know, that kind of a gloom. Right? A what? Storm. Okay, it's, you know, this is, you might say, hey, it's noisy. <laughs> you know, it, you, get the, you get the sense of the world is shaking. All right? There's an earthquake. Although the earthquake is not specified here, that's certainly in the backdrop. He's using language to recall the story, to recall, put yourself back there in Exodus 19, particularly at 19 to 24. Remember what that was like. Yes, it was the call for Israel to become the people of God. I've chosen you as my firstborn among the nations and... I brought you out of Egypt to bring you to myself and to enter into covenant with you. But as God is speaking those words, everybody's afraid. Uh, you know, we tend to think, well, yeah, I want God to speak to me. But when, they, when, when Israel heard it, they didn't like it. They said, okay, I'll use Moses. Just talk to us through Moses. We, we don't want to, yeah. Yeah, that's kind of a threatening, yeah. That's just intimidating, I imagine, you know, intimidating. Different sort of experience and, and you put that together with kind of the, the noise and the storm and the gloom and the fire and, and the shaking. And ah, it's, it's, it's got to be an unnerving sort of experience. Right? Yeah. But when we contrast that with the experience here, What what do we what what what's the mood of this experience? Okay, there's joyful assembly. Right? There's joy. Anything else indicate kind of mood or feel or here he just kind of uses the language of you have come, which is important language. You have come, or you have approached, or you have drawn near. This is the language of 4.16. Uh, it's also the language of 10.22. Let us draw near to God. So this language of coming is, is, is about approach. It's, I would suggest that it's liturgical language. It's the language that's used to describe how the priest would approach God, approach the tabernacle, that they would come before the tabernacle or come to the tabernacle or come into the presence of God. Um, and I think that that's the language here. Because Israel did come into God's presence here in some sense. They were at the foot of the mountain and they came to the mountain, but this was not a mountain they could touch. It was a mountain that generated fear in some sense, right? But here, he says, you have come to this mountain. And he, and he uses three words to, to describe the location. It's, it's Mount Zion, and it's also, what's another name for it? Heavenly Jerusalem. And when you think of Jerusalem, you think of the temple. So when you think about coming to Mount Zion, coming to the Jerusalem where the temple is, it's the city of the living God. It's the dwelling place of God. So we have that. It starts out with those three, line, that three, three ideas. Mount Zion, city of the living God, heavenly Jerusalem, the place where God dwells. And he says that explicitly, that you have come to God. Right? In fact, uh, that divine presence is you know, to God. But also he says to Jesus as well. Because when you come into the heavenly Jerusalem, when you come into that heavenly sanctuary, the Messiah, 
the city seated at the right hand of God. So when you come into this space, that is the heavenly Jerusalem, when you come into that space, you come into God's presence and you come into Jesus' presence because he's at the right hand. Right? He's our high priest, our Messiah. But then it also says, you know, there are three other groups that are there, right? Let's name those three groups. What three groups are there? All right, thousands of angels. Just imagine that picture. You might imagine Isaiah 6, the seraphim and the cherubim. You might imagine Revelation 5 and 4, where everything in heaven and on the earth and under the earth are praising God and that there are thousands upon thousands of angels gathered in the throne room of God that are part of the worship and the praise of God. The holy, holy, holy that's being sung as an angelic choir, you might say. Uh, and that angelic choir is surrounding in the throne and being and, and in the presence of God. Um well, let's just get all three up here and we can talk more about what's happening. What's our, what's another group? It says to the church of the first born. Actually, you know, your translation might, the first born ones, because it's not, if you just leave it singular, it sounds like, oh, that's the church of Jesus because he's the first born, right? I mean, that was stated of Jesus back in chapter 1. Um, but is that, it's the word, it's in the plural, though. It's the firstborn ones. Whose names, and, and you get that idea, the church of the firstborn ones, whose names are written in heaven. So they're, they belong in heaven. Their names are there. Their identity is there. Right? It's not a, a space that's that is um, a kind of um, outside of their their purview. Right? It's a place where they belong. But it's a church. It's the church of the firstborn ones. It's the assembly, and I think that's probably a better way of translating it is to translate assembly. So that when you come to the heavenly Jerusalem, when you enter this space, which is described in chapter 10 as the sanctuary, when you enter this space, you enter an assembly. You come to an assembly, right? You come to a space where the church is gathered, where the firstborn ones are gathered. And notice, everybody's firstborn. Everybody's firstborn. I, I think that's a, a, a really significant point to kind of draw out a little bit, that no one's secondborn, thirdborn. There's no ranking here. Everybody is firstborn. We're all participating. In, and the firstborn means you got the inheritance. To be firstborn means you're an heir. You have the primary inheritance. But in the faith, it's not that someone has the primary and others have secondary. It's rather everybody participates in the inheritance. So we're the assembly of the firstborn. I tend to think about that as uh, if we think about the angels gathered around the throne. The assembly, the, when the firstborn gather, those whose names are in, written in heaven, when they gather, when they assemble, they are participating in this reality. So I think if we think about kind of, um, let's say the church on earth, 
theologian would call that the church militant, the church that's still engaged, the church that's still fighting, still struggling, still you know, involved in, in the cosmic warfare here. The church on the earth, when it assembles, it participates in that. It's part of that. So the church in Singapore or the church in Frankfurt or the church in Spring Hill, you know, um, we're going to leave Texas out of it again. Um, you know, but the church somewhere, wherever the church gathers, uh, I have this kind of refrain that I've used for a long time that whenever the church gathers here, we're not here, we're there. We are, we are participating in that reality. We're participating in the heavenly Jerusalem. Now, if, if that's the way to think about this, then when we get to the next line, to God, to Jesus, mediator of a new covenant, um, but that line after God is the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Now, who is that? You know, this is this is one group. This is the second group. This is the third group. And these are righteous, perfected righteous. Now, the only subjects of perfection or of the perfecting in Hebrews are human beings. It's not, not another category of angels. Jesus was made perfect right, after the things he suffered. Um, let us go on to perfection. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. So this, this perfection, the righteous made perfect, is referring not to angels or to the church here, because the church here hadn't been made perfect. Right? We, we, we're not in this existence that we have in the moment. We are not perfected. But there's a category, there's a group that is perfected. And they are the righteous who have been perfected. And they are um, participating in this heavenly Jerusalem. I, I assume that those, you know, that, that might be the, the people we were talking about in Hebrews 11. And if it's true that that's who we're talking about in Hebrews 11, then it's true that, that those who died as a part of their church in Hebrews, wherever they were located, when those martyrs came, and that's also true of those that we have known who have already gone on. Yeah, Joe. Right forward it says, we have come to God the judge. Yeah. Which was right in the case to me. Mm -hmm. That it's the new creation. Things have been set right. When yeah. God judged. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I wanted, I was holding back on the judge part because we're going to get to another section here in a moment. But yeah. And what right is, and what I hear you saying um, is uh, the right's perspective is that this is an eschatological reality. And I think he's right. Because this, this moment, let's call this moment here the... Uh, eschatological assembly. Think of it as the final assembly, the end game assembly, the assembly at the end, the assembly when it's all finished, right? That's kind of what eschatological means. It, it's, it's the last. It's the last thing. It's at the end, right? And so the picture here is of something that's at the end. It's a picture of something that's ultimately coming, but is already here. That is, the church here 
participates in this future. We are participating in that future when we gather here. So that when we assemble in the great hall, or we assemble right here, or we assemble in our small groups, whenever we assemble, we are part of the assembly. We have all these different assemblies, right? Assembly in Spring Hill, an assembly down the street, an assembly here at Woodmont, an assemb assemblies around the world, and these are all scattered assemblies. But when they assemble, they participate in that reality around the throne. And it's a reality that is yet future, but still present. It's there, but it's not fully there. It's not fully here yet. Let's put it that way. All right. So we participate in that future when we gather. And I think that's why we can talk about perfected. Those are the righteous perfected that we're already, uh, because it's an eschatological reality, new creation reality. All right. I want to talk more about that in just a moment. That we participate in that. So the, the upshot of this seems to me um, is that we need to get our eye, we need to have our eyes open to see what we don't see. You remember the story of Elisha and his servant? What is that? Second Kings six, I think. It's in Dothan. Israel, and they're hiding from the Syrian army, and the Syrian army discovers them, knows they're in that city, and they surround the city, and Elisha's servant is full of fear, and Elisha says to his servant, um, there are more of us than there are of them. And that must have shocked Elisha's servant. <laughs> like, really? I mean, check that out. You know, look at that over there. Um, and then Elisha prays that his eyes that his eyes might be open. I, I think that there's a spiritual dynamic whereby our eyes are enabled to see what we can't see. And that when we assemble, our eyes are too often fogged in by what we're looking at. And we're, we're hindered from our, the spiritual perception, you might say, or the perception of faith, the eyes of faith, where we can open and see the reality, the heavenly reality. It's kind of like when the, the disciples were at the table with Jesus at Emmaus, right? And he broke the bread and he gave it to them and their eyes were opened. They could see. And that's, that's kind of the, when we, have a, when we have a high view of the assembly, a high kind of sacramental or, or uh, liturgical understanding of the assembly, um, I want to try to express this clearly. Um, we come into the assembly not just with a horizontal feel. Nothing wrong with the horizontal feel at all. That's part of, I mean, that's part of Hebrews 10, you know, that we encourage one another and we stir one another up, right? So we need that horizontal feel. That, that's a really important dimension. But when you have this kind of thinking about the assembly that we are entering into and participating in the heavenly assembly, that we are entering into the holy sanctuary, we are entering into the presence of God, and in the presence of God we join the chorus of the angels, and that all the church all over the world is present in that space, so that we're not 350 on Sunday or whatever it is, I don't know. We are millions. We're gathered in a space that has millions of 
worshipers, millions of people singing holy, holy, holy. Not only in the present, but all the saints, past, present, and I would say future as well. Because this is an eschatological picture here. Um, we have that sense of, of entering into the assembly that has a, a, a weight to it, a meaning, a significance that is more than just what we can see, more than the people around us. It's, it's a moment of communion, not only with the people who are sitting next to us, it's a communion with, with God primarily, right? With Jesus, by the Spirit, and with the saints who have gone before us. And we worship with the angels. You know, we're, we're part of that, we're part of that reality. And so when we think about entering into the assembly, it seems to me we need to pray for our eyes to be opened, to see more than what we can see. Mm -hmm. And so I imagine in the assembly, <clears throat> that's where I imagine being with, and y'all have heard me probably say this before on occasion, but you know, I don't go to the grave to visit my son. I go to church. Because right? that's where he is. He's in the assembly. And so I go to the assembly to be in the assembly of the around the throne to share that moment, a moment of joy, right? So <clears throat> let's let's go to uh, what Joe was talking about here, the idea of judge here. Look, it is kind of striking, it says you come to God, the judge of all kind of like just thrown in there you know um but judgment is still important in this context because remember there is a wilderness um there's a wilderness rebellion there's a wilderness unbelief that was judged in the wilderness and they could not enter the promised land okay? they died in the wilderness hebrews tells us in chapter three so this, there is a, a judgment going on here. So the whole sense of, um, um, of God's call for people to come into his presence, God is still a consuming fire. That is, God calls us into faithfulness, calls us into perseverance, calls us to, to live in a, in a way that trusts God. And that the judgment is still going to come. There's going to be a judgment. Um, God's going to judge evil. God's going to judge unbelief. You know, as God did with Israel. And I think that, that you know, and I know that there's differences of opinion about verse 24, about the blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Seems to me the blood of Jesus is the blood that um, is connected to the new covenant. You know the language of mediator of a new covenant. Think about this as the new covenant reality. And remember, in the new covenant reality, going back to Jeremiah eight, I mean Jeremiah thirty-one in Hebrews eight. This is the story we have in Hebrews three and four, particularly. The new covenant is what we have in Hebrews 8. And the, the point of the new covenant is, I will forgive your sins and remember them no more. To enter into this space is to enter into a space where there is no judgment. Right? Because the new covenant means there's no, there's no um, blood of Abel. There's no crying out for justice. There's no crying out for vengeance. The blood of Jesus has, as the mediator of a new covenant, has forgiven us in such a way that sin is remembered no more. So that's why this is filled with joy, whereas this has a lot of fear in it. We don't know. We're not sure here. There, there's this um, 
rebellion that takes place at the mountain. Remember the golden calf that takes place there, right? But here, because of Jesus has run ahead of us, and Jesus has entered into that space before us and for us, we run the race and follow him into that space, and we experience the, the blessings of the new covenant. So I think that's kind of something that's going on here. But let's, uh, we only got a few more minutes here. Let's, let's go to chapter, let's go to verse 25 and following. That, and here's where the judgment theme comes into play. Now, when Israel refused this opportunity, when they refused this invitation, there was judgment. And so the, the point to the people who are listening to this sermon, I think, is don't be like Israel. Don't refuse it. Because if they refused what was said on earth, right? Warned on earth, they refused him who warned them on earth. How much less will we if we turn away from him? That's apostasy language, turning away. It's not about making a mistake. It's not about struggling with sin. It's not about... Um, um, you know, ups and downs of the faith life. It's about, I'm done. And I'm rejecting it. I don't want, I'm not have anything else to do with it. I have nothing more to do with it. That's turning away. This is the apostasy language. And if that happens, how much less will we if we turn away from him who rewards from heaven? So then he quotes Haggai chapter 2. In Haggai chapter 2, we're not going to take time to go back and read it, but you can read Haggai chapter 2, verse 6. Haggai is the prophet after the exile. Haggai has come and said, why aren't y'all building the temple? You know, what, what's, what's up with this? And people were kind of saying, well, you know, look, it's not going to be much. It's going to be a little dinky temple. It's not going to be like it was for Solomon, you know. And Haggai says, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Um, it's going to shake. God is going to do another shaking. And I think this is language. It's language of Sinai. It's language you see in the Psalms, like Psalm 114 and other places. This shaking is about the coming of God. That's why Sinai is like it is. God has come. Right? And God's going to shake it again. God's going to shake the world again. He's going to shake heaven and earth again. Notice the shaking of heaven as well as earth. It's kind of like shaking it so that when the, the thing that is unshakable descends and roots out all that is shakable, roots out all that is transitory. What descends is the kingdom of God and its fullness that cannot be shaken. And it is the presence of God descending. It's what happens when God comes to Sinai. It shakes. It's what happens when God comes in the tabernacle and in the temple. There's a, there's a kind of a shaking there. And it's going to happen again, Haggai says, when the temple, God's going to come to the temple and it's going to shake. And I think the preacher here is telling us, keep running, keep going, because God's going to shake it again. And it's going to be a final shaking. Therefore, in verse 28, it's going to shake heaven and earth. Now, there is a translation problem in verse 27, removing of what can be shaken. Some would say that that's better translated something like changing or transforming. There's a, a debate about that. Um, doesn't need to concern us a whole lot. But I think the, the primary point is God is going to come and dwell. And we might even think of that the way John describes it in Revelation, that this reality is going to come 
in a new heaven and new earth. Because you got that Jerusalem, right? Remember John says, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And I saw Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem. I saw it descend out of heaven to the earth. All right, that's kind of the language. So that a voice comes from the throne and says, Behold, the dwelling of God is with humanity. And I will be their God, and they will be my people, which is part of the new covenant, right? It's a part of the, part of the covenant with Israel from the beginning. But it finds its fullness in, like Hebrews chapter 8, quoting Jeremiah 31, I will be their God, and they will be my people. So I think we can think about this as, okay, when we worship together, we're participating in that. We're participating in that future reality that's an already but not yet. And we're waiting for the day when God will shake all things, heaven and earth. He'll shake it and descend to dwell upon the new heaven and new earth where we will all be perfected and share that perfection together with God at the center and the Son, and the Spirit. And therefore, he says in verse 28, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Notice the present tense. I think it's probably that already, you know, we hadn't got it all yet. You know, it's not, not the fullness yet. We're receiving it. We're in, we're in process. Then notice two things. Let us be thankful gratitude since we have a great high priest let us enter into that space receiving that space let us be thankful and worship god acceptably with reverence and all anybody have a different word for worship there in verse 29 28 does everybody have worship? Is that what your translation says? Reverence. Yeah, reverence. But what's the verb before that? Worship with reverence and all. Serve with worship and oh, serve with reverence and all. I'm sorry. That we may offer to yeah. God an acceptable service. Oh, uh, acceptable service. Okay. All right. This is the word um, that is used for the priestly service in Israel. This is the service the priests offer. So I think we could even say, let's act like priests. Let's serve God as priests. We are God's priests in the world. And we, as priests, with all the responsibility that, that entails, with all the privilege that entails, the honor that entails, the, the, the gifts, I should say, that that entails, let us, not only let us be thankful and let us serve as priests in the world with reverence and awe. It's our priestly vocation, our priestly task, which will come up in chapter 13 as well. When he says we offer a sacrifice of lips, the fruit of our lips is a sacrifice, and we go about doing good as a sacrifice that we offer to God. But that's our priestly task. So the, con the conclusion here, that therefore in verse 28, given the great gift that God has given for which we are to be thankful, given the, the call to faith and the prospect of unbelief, and the prospect of unbelief is whatever's when God shakes the world, unbelief's going to want to be one of the things shaken out, you might say. We take up our task in the world. Now, when we take up our task in the world in this context, that means we, we keep walking through the life, a life that is um, assaulted and mocked. 
alive in a hostile culture, an oppressive culture, and we keep going, and we persevere. Like all the heroes in chapter 11, we persevere through the struggles. We're not perfect. None of those people in Hebrews 11 were perfect. But we are called to serve as priests, God's priests in the world, out of gratitude. And the gift that we have is that when we assemble, when we are the gathered people of God, we enter holy space. We enter heavenly Jerusalem. And we worship with the angels and with the church all over the world and with those who have gone before us. And we are one people, one assembly, gathered in God's presence. Joe? Well, when the scriptures speak of uh, believers will be bodily resurrected and those who are living will be transformed, that's what you're talking about here. Yeah, you, you can, you can, uh, you're thinking about 1 Thessalonians 4, right? Verses 13 to 18. Um, so, you know, when, when Jesus returns, says he will bring with the saints with him. He, he returned, that's Paul's language, he will bring with him. So the saints who are already here, you know, those righteous, already perfected, going to bring the saints with him, and then the church is going to meet him, says meet him in the air, that's the language that's used. But where do we go from there? See, some, some suggest, well, we will meet him in the air, then we're going to be forever with him in the air. Well, what air is that? I mean, that is that cosmic air or whatever, you know, that blue skies or what? Now, the, the word meet here is actually a technical word for um, when an emperor or, a, 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 you know, a dignitary was coming into a city, the people would go out to greet them and then bring them into the city. Like, the Jewish leaders in Rome, when they, when they knew Paul was coming, they went out to meet Paul. That's the same word that's used in Acts 28. And they would go out to meet Paul, and then they would escort Paul back into the city. When we meet the Lord in the air, with Paul's language here, I think he's conceiving of that as something like, we will be, the dead will be raised, and Jesus brings the saints with him, and we will be transformed, those of us who are still alive, and we will meet this company in the air, and then we will escort them back. Not to the old earth, but to a new earth, a new heaven and new earth, a new sky, a new cosmos and a new earth with transformed bodies and a transformed earth. So that's that's the picture I have. And, and yeah. we speak of hope, that's what you're talking about. Everything. Yeah, well, that's uh, Paul in Romans 8 says, you know, the hope, and he identifies hope as the resurrection of the body. Yeah. That is to be fully restored as human beings. Uh, not just restored in our spirit, if you want to put it that way, but restored in our bodies. And that the whole earth is restored. You know, we've talked about this in previous classes, that the resurrection of Jesus means that we're going to be resurrected. But the resurrection of Jesus also means the creation is going to be resurrected. Because the resurrected Jesus is a resurrected creation. His body is part of the creation. And when, when His body is recreated or renewed, resurrected, it's part of the creation. Jesus hasn't just cut Himself off from the creation. He hasn't gone beyond the creation. 
still has a created body, a creation body, a new creation body that won't die. It's an immortal body, incorruptible body, but it's still a body and it's still creation. And we will have a body that our vile bodies, as Paul, as the King James puts it in Philippians 3, our, our bodies will be transformed into his glorious body. And that the whole creation then will experience resurrection. And that the whole creation will be renewed. So there's a new heaven and a new earth. And I think it's, it's the sort of thing that this reality comes to earth. It doesn't just stay up there, you know, if we use that spatial language. It doesn't just stay far away beyond the Hubble telescope or wherever, you know, you think about it. It, it comes to earth. It unites heaven and earth and be, they become one. Right? Did God give us some thought about this platonic theory about going to heaven and to die? Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, I think when we die, we join that space up there, but we don't want to stay there. <laughs> we, want to, we want to be resurrected and come to earth and have the fullness of, of what God's intent is in redemption. And, but, man, there's a lot more to say about that. But I, I think this uniting of heaven and earth is a really important dimension of what salvation is. And we used to sing about it, you know. Is it in the song, this is my father's world? No. Yeah, this is my father's world. Isn't that the one that has the last line that says, when heaven and earth become one? Isn't that that line? I think that's right, isn't it? Is it that long? Or is it, bears Lord Jesus? No, I think it's, you have to check me out on that one. I don't, not sure. My memory's not working for me on that one. Anyway, thank you for, we extended the time here a little bit, so thank you for your patience. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Can I do a 30-second commercial while you're still here? Uh, I hope uh, that a few of you will sign up.